Good evening and welcome to the March 11th, uh, 2019 Council Work Session. And we have, a, we, have a, we have a smaller group today. We have two councillors traveling to the National League of Cities and a third councillor, Claire Surratt, busy with work. And, and Alan Zelenka will show up as his commute allows. So we will start. And our first uh, piece is committee reports and items of interest. I have a couple of things, but I'm wondering if councillors have. OK, Emily, take it away. Thank you very much. I don't have any committee reports due to snow and budget committee meetings. So um, their usual refrain, where's the downtown day center? Time keeps marching on. Um, and at the very least, we need bathrooms downtown. It's getting warmer. There's more people down today. It's going to keep getting more crowded, which means more bodies. So please, I need some bathrooms downtown. And I had a couple other things, but I guess they'll wait till after break. Thanks. Okay, anybody else? Oh, you have something, Mike? I thought I did, but... Okay. All right, well, if it occurs to you, you know, you, you can wave at me. Um, so uh, just a couple of things. First, I was uh, gone, was it last week? The week before last. I've lost track of time, but I went on the United Front trip. This was the 35th year that the cities of Eugene, Springfield, Lane County, Lane Transit District, Willamette Lane, Parks and Rec, and Springfield Public Schools all go together annually to Washington, D.C., both to meet with our uh, delegation with Wyden, Merkley, and DeFazio, but also to meet with federal agencies. And, um, and many of our uh, investments locally have been really uh, facilitated by those trips and the contacts we make and the relationships formed with those agencies. So among the um, meetings that I participated in was Department of Transportation, where we talked about Franklin Boulevard. That's a joint investment, Springfield and Eugene, and their new, the federal grant has sort of changed in some of its form. So we got more information about that and some insight and then just sort of kept that conversation going. I also met with, um, EPA and it's their investment in our brownfields in the riverfront that has enabled us to do this development that we will be talking about that the subject of this meeting today. So some of these are really kind of ongoing relationships, very, very worthwhile and very interesting. So, um, and I was, I was there while the snowstorm was happening and I heard from a lot of people about the snowstorm while I was there and, uh, you know, I, so I want to say a couple of things. One is really deep appreciation for our public works department, for the extent to which everybody uh, was all hands on deck and working as hard and fast as they could to really dig people out and get the city back up and running. It was really a monumental task. And I recognize that we have 168,000 citizens, and I heard from a dozen of them. So keeping in mind most people were served and patient and understood what was going on. And so really appreciate that very, very good work of the team. And uh, I, ha I had a, a very pointed takeaway from this, which is uh, that many of the emails that I got, I felt people were um, really struggling because it was cold, it was scary, and it was very isolating. And so I think some of those thoughts around how people feel isolated in those situations, if we think of, when we think about an earthquake event, where we might have communication systems down. So it was another reminder to me about neighborhood, the CERT training and neighborhoods and how we uh, look out for people in neighborhoods and particularly thinking about people who are living in apartments that are all electric and if the electricity is not running, how do we take care of them? They're, they're not gonna necessarily be stocked up with food. And so with that in mind, I want just one more uh, a promo for Prepare Out Loud, which is April 4th starting at 5 and going until 7.30. The first part will be, it'll be a South Eugene High School. It'll be a kind of an agency fair where people can get lots of information, go to a lot of booths and learn how to prepare, and then there'll be a presentation. So a great opportunity for the community to really think, having just come through the snowstorm, what it felt like in their house, where they were prepared and not prepared, that you can actually take all that immediate sense of urgency and go to prepare out loud and, and uh, upgrade your system. And, um, and then one final uh, comment really for the public, which is that 
a reminder that if you have trees and limbs down on your property, it is actually your responsibility to take care of that. And the city is not going to swing by and take care of things that are, you know, at the edge of your driveway or um, they're, they're yours. And so you'll have to make your plans for that, however, but the city has its hands full with their, with their own uh, public property. So that's my pitch and did something come occur to you in that time okay other, well other than not to say I, I concur and agree that our public works department did a monumental job <clears throat> under the circumstances of what we faced all in a big hurry um, I I think that the in the place we live we take trees and their existence in our city more seriously than many cities do and we like them and we think it's a good thing, um, which makes maintaining power in a, in, a, in a storm situation that much more difficult. And I don't know the appropriate way to have that discussion because so much of that is eWeb's bailiwick. But I think that the more we can do to assist them with the more lines they would like to bury underground as opposed to up in the air would be wise for the sake of resiliency and people keeping power in a storm event. So I, I don't know the part we play in that conversation in detail, but I really would like to see us do that if we can. I think that would be wise and it would be helpful to an awful lot of people to maintain power in a situation like that. Okay, thank you. And so now I'm actually adjourning the meeting of the Eugene City Council and opening the meeting of the uh, down to the Eugene Urban Renewal Agency and for a conversation about the riverfront. You start whenever you're ready. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, City Councilors. My name is Michael Kennison. I'm um, I'm with uh, the Community Development Division, and I'm here with Emily Proudfoot with our Parks Division, and uh, Maurizio Botolico uh, with our Finance Division, and we're here to talk to you about the Riverfront Urban Renewal District. Specifically, we're going to provide you with a brief overview uh, of the district, some of the prior investments that we've made, um, what um, current investments that we've committed to with uh, urban renewal funds, uh, then Emily's going to talk at length about uh, the park and the park design process, where we're at there, um, what the park budget is and funding needs. Um, and Maurizio is going to talk about the financial capacity of the district. And then we'll kind of clarify next steps and leave it open then for questions and discussion. Um, I would like to clarify that we're not asking you to do anything today, to take action on anything today. We're just here to provide information and answer any questions that you have. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, in the AIS, you may have noticed that we had information in there on uh, future potential investments in the district beyond the park. Um, but um, to preserve time for today's discussion um, of the park and its needs, we're going to postpone any, any conversation really about that or presentation about that, and we'll be coming back to you at a later date to be able to do that. The, um, the Riverfront Urban Renewal District um, is 246 acres. It was established in 1985. It stretches from um, I-5 in the east um, along uh, the Willamette River all the way to the Ferry Street Bridge, um, south all the way over to Pearl Street uh, into downtown, and then makes its way back to I-5 along Franklin Boulevard. It was amended in 2000, or the plan was amended in 2004, and we added some acreage, expanded the list of project activities, and established a spending limit and a sunset date of 2024. And I'd also like to point out that the brown area here marks the boundary of the uh, downtown riverfront development, and the hatching here in the green is the boundary of the park. So those uh, areas are entirely within the uh, district. The, the goals of the district include improving connections between the downtown core and the river and to stimulate development and amenities in the area in which the federal courthouse is currently located, where that star is and what we now refer to as the courthouse district. Um, you may recall that it doesn't, hasn't always looked the way that it looks today. 
Um, at one time, it was uh, the center of um, agricultural uh, packaging and cannery there with uh, Chiquita and Agripac uh, businesses. And in the early 2000s, we purchased property there using urban renewal funds. Um, and uh, cleared the property um, and helped get it ready for redevelopment, eventually selling it to the federal government for construction of an $80 million federal courthouse and uh, to Northwest Community Credit Union for construction of their $20 million, uh, $20 million headquarters building there. In terms of current uh, commitments with district funds, um, as part of the downtown riverfront development, we have committed to spending $3.7 million for the uh, three easternmost crossings that are oop, displayed there in orange. Um, and those are at Pearl High and Hilliard. Um, and all 10 of the crossings are um, scheduled to begin construction in 2020. We also have committed um, to invest $5.2 million in bringing the Riverfront Development Project to fruition um, to help um, cover a share of uh, 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 community costs of public uh, infrastructure as part of that project. And redevelopment of the Riverfront provides a critical opportunity to complete the vision of connecting our downtown to the river, something we have long awaited in our community. The Riverfront Park is a key component of implementing this vision, um, almost the last piece, if you will, to get to the river. Emily is going to talk with you now about how this exciting project is shaping up um, and what it will take to bring it to fruition. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Um, here we go. Uh, so as you may know, over the last year, we've been working with our uh, consultant team from Walker Macy Landscape Architects out of Portland. Um, and they brought with them a pretty big team. Um, and I'm, I'm starting off with this tonight um, because uh, I've talked to you quite a bit about the public outreach that we've done so far, which was kind of a hallmark of that first phase. But we also, in this first phase, did an enormous amount of data gathering. So uh, we had uh, consultants who are public artists and environmental toxicologists and uh, people who specialize in river fluvial geomorphology and uh, architecture, site and cultural history, and much more. Um, and so uh, here's just a quick slide of, of what uh, our geotechnical work looked like, which was that we poked some holes in the site and looked at a lot of different kinds of dirt and profiling. And we did this in a lot of ways and have big reports on a whole bunch of different aspects of the project um, like this. Um, so that's all to say that you know we have a pretty complicated site and a pretty big vision for it. So this is... Uh, so uh, the community really told us and verified again um, that was that what they told us in the in the master plan almost 10 years ago, which is that they really want a cultural landscape that's uniquely Eugene and a place that will teach and inspire. And so that's really about, um, you know, that people want an urban riverfront park where they can come and see the river and then learn about our community and its environmental history within that context. Um, so. I like this slide because it shows how much green space we have uh, near the center of our city. And there's the Downtown Riverfront Park right in the middle across the river from Alton Baker Park, which is about a 400 acre park that's mostly um, natural area. So it's about a third of a mile along the river. Um, there is, uh, the original park site was three acres, um, basically from the new bike path location forward to the river through the work that we did um, on redefining um, the site plan for the downtown riverfront redevelopment site. Um, we added one acre of a downtown riverfront plaza and you can see that uh, here. It's this part it's right here. And so immediately adjacent to the park, um, you know, we have some just very, there's some commercial mixed use, so there's a steam plant on the south end, a restaurant proposed for the north end, eWeb headquarters, and then residential and hotels surrounding it. These bookends of, of uh, mixed use and commercial space are really what is going to make this park sing, and I think those, uh, those two land use types really complement each other and are important, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, so what we heard from the community is that people really want an inclusive and flexible set of open spaces along the river. They want it sustainable. They want us thinking about how we use water and storm water and, um, and, and thinking about the environment 
Um, there's a cultural and environmental interpretive piece here that they're really interested in. Um, they want a balanced approach between urban and natural. So they don't, you know, when we talk about an urban riverfront park, it could be just all pavement and a few trees and some glass buildings, and that, that's not what people are looking for. Nor, on the other hand, are they looking for a really, really natural and, and very green park along the river, because we have a lot of that already. So they're looking for a balance. And then I think one of the most important things that we heard is they want it to be safe. So this is our existing condition, and I don't think that it actually meets any of the things I just talked about. Um, <laughs> I think many of you are familiar with the cattle chute of uh, chain link fencing um, along a very the top of a pretty steep river bank on the outside bend of the river that uh, has a lot of riprap and uh, non-natives invasives on it. Um, and and there's, there's trees there too, and we're working to preserve a lot of them. But predominantly, this is the feeling you have when you cross this site now. And so where we're headed with this uh, park design concept is really a layered landscape where we move from a more urban um, treatment up, let's, where's my red arrow there, where we have a more urban experience here and the and a multimodal path that we reconstruct. And then it gets softer as we move out toward the river. But, but very importantly, we're maintaining and creating these view corridors that were so important in the uh, development of the master plan. And so here's the current plan that we are working with, and I've, I've been over this a few times, so I won't, I won't belabor it, but um, I will. So here's the park plaza that we're talking about, and then the riverfront park, which extends from the steam plant to north of the north headquarters. Basic highlights include uh, overlooks, um, uh, the multimodal path development, uh, independent pedestrian paths that reach out over the river to these viewpoints, and then uh, a pretty, bigger plaza here that I'll talk about a little bit more, and then much improved access to the top of the uh, Peter DeFazio Bridge. We'll be saving the eWeb uh, plaza for now. And so this is just a quick concept of what that starts to look like, where we're creating those viewpoints among you know stormwater treatment planters. Um, uh, if this image were complete, the steam plant would be in the upper right corner there. Um, but really starting to open those views and create an environment where people have access to the river visually and can spend time there and enjoy it. Um, and so what we're talking about uh, now, and I think I, I've mentioned this in previous sessions, um, is that we've broken the project into two phases. So the initial phase of work that we'll be, we'll be completing for 2021 is the riverfront, is the approximately three acre riverfront park piece. And then as the phase two after 2021, we'll be looking at the plaza development piece. And we elected to do that because um, we didn't, you know, at the time, we were moving forward. We, did, we weren't sure yet what the buildings would be like and when they might be constructed around this. And so we wanted to uh, get more information before we, and more programming information before we decided to fully move forward with the design. Um, so there's a park plan in from a drone view that you wouldn't see unless you were a tiny person in a drone. Um, <laughs> And here's uh, some of that circulation that I was talking about. So the big thick line is the multimodal path. It's split between pedestrians and bikes. And then the small dash lines are the more uh, pedestrian oriented pathways. Um, this is a cross section of that multimodal path. And we heard a lot about people wanting to separate the bike and the pedestrian um, uses uh, really for safety of, of users on the site. And these are some of the different kinds of landscapes that you'll see on the site. Um, we have lawn, we have uh, terraces, there's places to view the river from, and, um, and just a variety of landscapes that are more manicured to less. I always like this section because you can see where we're taking back the existing grade, which is this red line right here. And we're going to lay the bank back roughly between this, uh, the electrical tower here and Fifth Avenue. So we'll lay the bank back probably... Um, about a 10 foot of elevation that we will bring back here. So we'll be cutting this off and then creating uh, new viewing platforms and other amenities within that laid back bank, which ideally then um, enables you to see the river from further away as opposed to just having to come all the way to the tippity top of the bank to see it. And so here's another a great image looking north from the steam plant of the overlooks, the multimodal path, and uh, that sort of independent pedestrian path that starts to reach out over the river. Um, we are heavily incorporating public art and interpretation, and this is the place where the cultural landscape, the vision for the cultural landscape 
really hits the ground. So this is a proposed um, art pavilion at the end of Fifth Avenue, and we really see it as a, a way to draw people out to the river. So if you're walking down Fifth from downtown, you'll see the sculpture, and we see it as a place for performing art um, where we could perhaps have projection or let's see here. So here's a here's a tiny a smaller image of a movie being played on a screen there and it lights up at different colors at night. This is a view looking back into the development, so from the river. So it really brings you through to this lower platform, and then when you look back, these are just massings of buildings. This is not what they would really look like, fortunately. Um, but it will uh, you can see back into the development this way. So I think this is a really nice job of illustrating how it brings you out and over the river. Um, and looking back into the development. So then from an interpretation uh, standpoint, we have developed a thematic plan around that. Um, we have some goals around it and that, that the interpretive pieces are welcoming, that they're low maintenance, and that they're experienced rather than read. So that really they're integral to the landscape design. They're not a series of 24 by 36 inch signs on or placards on posts. Um, so the first interpretive element is energy, and these are all pretty high concept right now, but we're, we're working on them. Um, and the inspiration for this, for this piece is around steam and um, the opportunities with steam, how you can color it and make shadow, and around turbines, and that this was a location where you know the turbines within eWeb created steam to heat our downtown. Um, and so the idea here is that potentially this piece is inlaid into the overlook just north of the steam plant. Um, and that it's a circle and it uh, part of the circle that extends out over the platform actually has steam and light that come out. Um, and then that the inside portion is inlaid into the pavement there and has some sort of interpretive language around how steam may have heated downtown or you know other, maybe an inspirational quote or something about steam. The second interpretive element is about ecology, and um, we're interpreting this uh, on the pedestrian paths that reach out um, not away from the multimodal path and, and toward the river. So um, the inspiration for this piece is, or these pieces are that, um, you know, over time we've done a pretty darn good job of taking a wild and meandering river and squishing it into one area. Um, much to many of our benefits, so I will. <laughs> um, but that it, it had a much more meandering character. And so the idea here is, and I think I showed this slide last time for those of you who were here, is that um, that these meandering river um, ways could be interpreted in the pavement of these uh, pedestrian paths and then come up into a, um, a backbench panel, which then would potentially talk about plants or the ecology of the river or the history of the river or something like that in several locations along this path. The third interpretive element um, is community, and the location is particularly important on this one. Um, so we're proposing that it be located at the bottom of the access path that would go up and over uh, the Peter DeFazio Bridge. Um, and the story that we're interpreting here is, is the story about the African-American community that used to live across the bridge, um, uh, called the Across the Bridge Community. Um, and that community was displaced when the Ferry Street Bridge was constructed. Um, but at that time, African Americans were not allowed to live within the city limits, and so um, whites lived here as well. And this is a photograph of some children um, in the Ferry Street Bridge community at that time. And um, it was a very vibrant community. There were many wonderful things that have hap that happened there. And um, I think it was very difficult for the African American community when it was when it was moved and dispersed. Um, and so the idea for this piece is that um, that it's a drinking fountain that's accessible by an inclusive, accessible and inclusive for everyone, and provides water at all these different levels. And then, um, and then the photograph of of the children by the water pump is here, and it's in glass. And so you can see it from both sides as you come down the bike path. Um, and the, and that story is told in that window. Um, and we've had focus groups look at each of these elements. And um, in particular, with this one, we met with um, several members of the African American community here in Eugene, and, and they were very. Um, they were very excited about this project. They were very enthused about it. And I think there's some great opportunities then to take this story across the river and, we, and as we start to look at the master plan for Alton Baker Park, talk about an opportunity there where we might be able to talk about the Across the Bridge community further. The last interpretive element would be on the plaza site. Um, and this one is industry. Um, and it's really an opportunity to talk about the mill race. We've heard over and over how 
uh, how people are excited about the mill rays, how they would love to open it, but it's not really feasible here. Um, there's a pipe that runs with the mill race under it, 20 feet underground. Um, but you know, historically, it was uh, both uh, a resource of industry and recreation in our community. Um, I left this ice skating picture. And so the idea here is that we would incorporate some sort of children's play or um, that involved water and then could interpret the mill race you know, that was right underneath the plaza. So I think it, it has some lovely opportunities to um, really create fun and family and learning in the same breath. So that's a quick presentation of where we are on the design for now, and then we'll talk a little bit about current funding and costs. So um, right now the project budget is about $14 million, and it's it's broken out as you see above. And we have, uh, we have current funding right now um, from uh, park capital funds, stormwater capital funds, and transportation capital funds um, for the project. And so we, we're looking at about a $5 million gap there. Um, but if we're looking at construction costs, I think, you know, these sites are very difficult, and we've seen that across other sites. So uh, my preamble about the complexity of the site, including you know the crisscross of utilities there, that it's a brownfield site, that um, riverfront sites are, are typically pretty challenging to work within, and they're very technical, especially from a permitting perspective. I think um, you'll see that these other waterfront park costs are somewhat comparable to what we're looking at, and ours is actually a little bit less, so it feels like it's, it's somewhat right size for our community. Um, so then from a timeline standpoint, uh, we're looking at developing the Riverfront Park over two construction seasons. So this coming summer, uh, we'll be working on riparian enhancement and utility relocation. So we'll lay back the bank between uh, Fifth Avenue and the tower. Uh, we'll be doing some a lot of riparian planting in the areas where we don't lay it back. And then um, and then fundamental utility location, as we, there's a big band of electric and fiber running along the top of the bank there that we'll have to get out of the way to lay the bank back. Then in 2020, um, you'll see full construction of the park uh, happen, and uh, ideally it'll be well established in time for 2021. So, uh, and much of this work is happening in uh, conjunction with the infrastructure work happening on the development side of the site. So we're trying to make efficient uses of resources there. Uh, last but not least, here's the plaza. And you know, the activities in the plaza um, I think are, are pretty key to what we heard from the public. They really want a family-friendly area. This is the urban portion of the Riverfront Park. Um, it's also really important for our um, our Williams and Dame partnership as the as the activities in the buildings that they're putting next to the park, like the restaurant and the hotel, or those are very much symbiotic relationships, right? So that you're programming the plaza and the restaurant is there to help provide beverage or food or you know any of those kinds of activation pieces. They're pretty, they're pretty important together. Um, we're talking about $4 million in initial reserve uh, for this project, and that includes an, uh, the estimated LID cost. So um, the LID cost for the park site would be about $1.4 million as it's currently calculated. And that gets all of our, that, you know, that pays for the park properties portion of the infrastructure and utilities needed to, to, to serve the site. So it's, uh, every, every site on the development um, does pay into the LID. So, you know, we don't, while we do have a design for this that we did as part of the uh, concept planning, um, I think, you know, we will be revisiting that and making sure that we're meeting the programmatic needs that we have for that site. We're just, they're kind of in flux right now and, and, and we're probably doing that a little bit further down the road. But this is the, this captures the spirit of the a kind of place that I think that we want downtown on our riverfront. We want it to be playful. We want people to come for events or food carts or markets. Um, you know, we want it to be, you know, fully accessible and, and really fun for everyone and a place that people bring their families when they come here. People, when they come to Eugene, they go to the riverfront, they find the river because that's a hallmark of our downtown. So. And uh, from now, I'll turn it over to Maurizio for financial information. All right, thanks, Emily. Uh, so I'll be providing an overview of the financial capacity of the Riverfront District. Uh, so as you can see on the top half of this slide, uh, it is estimated the district may have approximately $18.1 million in total financial capacity to fund new expenditures through fiscal year 24 when the district is expected to sunset. <clears throat> It is important to note the district does not currently have this amount on hand. Rather, this is an estimate of existing district resources plus projected revenue through fiscal year 24. 
So the district has two types of revenue as shown here. Let's start with tax increment revenue, which comes from property taxes. For reference purposes, the district is expected to collect $2.3 million of tax increment revenue in the current fiscal year, and this amount is projected to grow to $3.1 million annually in fiscal year 24. This projected revenue increase assumes growth in the overall taxable value of the district, including newly taxable land and improvements resulting from the downtown redevelopment through FY24. The uncommitted tax increment amount of $10.3 million that's shown on the slide is an estimate of how much tax increment revenue may be available through FY24 for new expenditures after all committed expenses are funded. These committed expenses include operating expenses through fiscal year 24, uh, and as Michael mentioned, the three Eastern Railroad Quiet Zone crossings and $5.2 million for downtown riverfront infrastructure costs and other DDA expenses. The other revenue type in the district is program revenue, which are dollars from non-property tax resources, such as land sales and rental income. The $7.8 million figure you see here is after setting aside $1 million for loans in the district. This amount includes $3.2 million from a recent land sale to the University of Oregon, and also future land payments from Williams and Dame of $2.2 million expected to be received by fiscal year 24. So moving on to the bottom half of the slide, if $5 million of district resources are allocated for the park and $4 million for the plaza, that would leave around $9.1 million available for other projects through fiscal year 24. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Michael to review next steps. So we have um, a River Guides meeting scheduled for March 21st, and uh, the River Guides is our uh, advisory body for the district. Um, and we'll be um, making a staff re recommendation on meeting the park and plaza funding needs as, as presented today. And then uh, we'll be back here uh, for a work session on April 8th. Um, with uh, the River Guide's recommendation and a, and a specific budget request uh, for you to take uh, action on at that time. And with that, we'll uh, leave it open for discussion. Okay, thank you very much for that explanation. I'm thinking about the frozen mill race. Like, if we keep having winters like this, we might be ice skating on the mill race again. I don't know. So I have, <laughs> I have Mike in the queue. Anybody else needing a, and Chris? Okay, take it away, Mike. Thank you, Mayor. Great presentation, guys. I really appreciate that. And Emily, I agree entirely that our downtown riverfront is the hallmark of our downtown. I couldn't agree more. Um, you mentioned there's three and a half acres in the entirety of that park, right? More or less? It's three to three and a half. So the existing riverfront park parcel that we, um, that we just purchased is 3.1 acres. And then there's a mix of property ownership between um, the eWeb North headquarters building and the DeFazio Bridge. Right. So, we, but we manage that right now as Skinner View Park, part of Skinner View Park. So Remind me property. when the sale of that property was completed. Last December. So of eighteen, right? Um, Fourteen million for the budget. Nine million looks like urban renewal. Is any of the bond money from the parks bond being spent in any portion or part of? Doing There's a little bit of bond measure, like half a million that we're thinking of so far. Yeah, for the riverfront park right now. Okay. And that was in the park capital funds I was talking about. Half a million, okay. Um, when did you start the planning process? Well, maybe 10 years ago or this particular, <laughs> this particular process. We probably, started, we probably started it 18 months ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The reason this is important is because we're going to talk about a park a little bit later during the capital improvement program part, and I just want to have some data for comparison's sake to one of the things that we're going to talk about. What percentage of the 14 is authorized already to do, to spend? I'm not certain. It's all, most of it is in the CIP and we have a little bit of funding right now in our budget to, to work on the project, right? So we probably have, I think we have six million in, you know, in the project right now just to work on it. Um, and some of that will be expended for. How much is in the CIP? Is it all 14 million? 
No, only nine. Nine's in the CIP. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, actually, let me correct that. So it is, right now, it's 5.5, .5, and we had 3.5 that was previously appropriated. Gotcha. So if that helps. Eight. Yeah, all right. It's, it's eight it. to nine. It's just not all of it shows up in the current in the CIP that you'll be reviewing tonight. Um, and you estimate completion of the project in its entirety in November of this year? No. Do th that one slide says. Yeah, so we're looking at the downtown riverfront park piece, so that first three, three and a half acres. Right. Uh, that'll be done by the fall of 2020 or spring of 2021. So the idea is that it's open and ready for the games in 2021. The plaza will be probably starting in 2021 or 2022. Got it. Awesome. Thank you very much. You guys are doing a great job with that, and I'm Thanks. excited about it. Okay. Chris? Thank you. Um, great presentation. Really, uh, really very thorough. And what I particularly like is as we move along, it's great to check in with us so that we're aware of what's happening um, as this goes, um, particularly in light of any funding gaps or anticipated needs, because if you can say, here's where we are, here's what we want to do, here's the money we have so far, here's some of the ideas we have, it, it very important to feel like we've got options and time to think about it rather than say, well, we've gotten down the road, we've run up against a roadblock, we're in a corner and we got to act fast. Um, this is the opposite of that and I really, I really like that. So I think this is perfect to bring it at this time so we can get a sense of what it is you want to do and where you think the potential gaps might be so that we can be very thoughtful about what we'll do to fill it. And at this stage of the game, there's a number of ways we can fill it. And I think that's really giving us the opportunity to be creative. Um, uh, some of the options you're even just chatting about sound like really good ones, and we just need to work through uh, where we're going to go. Um, I also want to say that the plans you've got to this point, and I realize they're rough, there's, you know, it's just renderings at this point, um, but the way of thinking where your mind is going, I think is really good. And I think it will be very compatible with Williams and Dane's development that's going to go there. And for me, that's at a very important point. You don't want the park to be incompatible with the commercial and residential development and, and vice versa. And this looks like you're going to be in constant conversation. So this will come together in a way uh, where it will flow very well. And so uh, I couldn't, I, I, I just can't tell you how happy I am. Um, and these renderings will evolve as time goes along. I can think of things I would do with them, but that's part of the fun of creating these projects. Um, so. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great presentation. It was very thorough. Um, I wanted to first just um, thank you for the history piece that you guys have. I think it's very thoughtful. I think it's an excellent example of a community that most people in our town don't know ever existed or what happened or you know any of the history of it. And I think it's an excellent option to include in this project. So thank you for considering that. I, I also do love the mill race frozen. That is a great picture. Um, uh, my question was, so this is one of six new park projects that we have, are very luckily have planned in the future for our city. So my question is, um, should we expect this level of quality for our other five parks? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I think, I think. Um, for effort, yes. <laughs> well, yes, you should, you should. I think, you know, the downtown riverfront is a metropolitan park. And so, um, I, you know, when if you're thinking about a neighborhood park, um, do you want a thousand people to come there every day? Well, may, maybe not, you know. Um, but we are, you know, I think we're really committed to um, hearing what communities say. I mean, so much of what's in this plan is about what we heard from the community. We, you know, when we build stuff, we build it to a very high quality and to a quality that we can maintain. So it may not be shiny and polished, but it's to a quality we can maintain over time. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and then, you know, to the degree that we, um, you know, there are, I, I know the project you're talking about, Jennifer. No, I mean, we, we, <laughs> but have all the, all, we have five other projects, not just Stryker Field. Right, and so there are five other projects, and all of those projects will, you know, 
we think really carefully about what we're building it and how we're building it and the budget that we have. Mm -hmm. And um, and and those are the, and that they're, you know, and then things like safety and maintainability are always at the top of our list. So we, you know, we work really hard to provide a very high level of, you know, park experience for anyone, depending upon what type of park it is. And, um, and we're, we're really committed to that because we know how important parks are to, to the to the community. They're a huge reason why people live here and we get nine million park visits a year. So if you know, if that's happening and people are enjoying our parks this much every day in our community, we're you know, our mission is to deliver. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I had a question on about the one acre um, plaza. You say here four million initial reserve. So what is your, I mean, does that mean you're gonna want more than four million? I think this is definitely, I think it will take more than four million to build it. I will be honest about that. Especially with, um, I think the component of the permitting costs here are, is a pretty, it's a significant component of the park cost, which is the, the LID component that we are uh, paying into. So that's 1.4 million um, that we're paying into development of the streets and utilities and to bring services to the site. The three acre riverfront park is not paying any LID, you know, portion. So, um, so that's a pretty big component of it. And it, um, you know, and, and then I think if we're thinking about what people have really asked us for in their downtown riverfront park and um, sort of working together with Williams and Dame, I think it's gonna take more than 4 million. Um, we don't know what it is yet because we need to, you know, be thinking about our, you know, what are we programming for? What are we designing for? And, and we're not sure of that yet. We have an idea of how we want it to look and feel, but we're, we're not certain yet. Well, I, I would assume that if anyone was asked, what do you want in your park, they could easily spend four million in any oh, park of course. our city. <laughs> so I right. mean, we don't necessarily spend money for the, you know, the Cadillac version of everyone's park. No, yeah. and I don't think that's what we're looking for. You know, but I do think if you need urban plaza space um, for, you know, uh, carts and programming and play and all those kinds of things, I mean, pavement is actually one of the most expensive things that we do, and we need it to be fully accessible. And I think just some of those basic costs to get it to a, a basic level of functionality, we might be able to do it for four million, but I don't know. And it's a few years down the road. I don't know what the economy looks like. I don't know what. You know, I, I'm just not sure, and we, I don't know quite what we're building yet. So I think, you know, we're not building a Cadillac Riverfront Park either. I think that's my personal or professional opinion. I think we're, we're, we're doing a nice balance of, of pavement and natural areas and really listening to people about the quality, the quality that they want for it. Um, I think that the plaza piece is the more urban piece, and so we're gonna be seeing a little bit more pavement or a little more area for that kind of activation that we really need for that site to be successful. Yeah. So the other park that's probably the closest to this would be the West Bank Park, which is also on a river just up north. Is it, I mean, it's kind of a similar, yes or no, it's not in my area, but I would assume I would, it's kind of a similar challenges and... It has some similar challenges, but I don't think we have the programming expectations for it that we would at this site, right? So to me, West Bank Park is likely going to be developed more as, um, you know, probably more a neighborhood park amenity on the river um, because we don't, you know, that's a great opportunity because we have some extra land that's close by that serves the neighborhood. And so I think we're seeing that site as an opportunity to um, provide neighborhood park amenities in an, an unser a currently unserved area. Great, I appreciate it, thank you. Yeah, Emily. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer, for getting my question started. Um, the initial reserve, the money we already have, where did that come from? Are you talking about for the Riverfront Park, the nine million? No, the plaza. We So we don't have that reserved yet. So it says initial reserve. That's that a proposal. We think we need that much money. Yeah, that, and that's, again, that's what we were, I was just talking about with Jennifer, is that, you know, that would be the starting amount that right, we think I, we I need. Right, I get that part. I just, yeah. in my life, when I have something reserved, I, I already have it, so I thought we had that four million. Um, oh darn. I, I do like the design. Um, I, I met with you last week and that was really helpful. Um, I especially like how much uh, outreach was successful and you were able to include those designs. I went to a couple of the sessions and, and watched them change in response. So congratulations and thank you. Um, 
I like the river views, and I really like the subjects for the interpretive panels. I, I like that there's more than one, um, and that they're in sections. I, I think that's a cool thing. Um, and, and once again, I'm gonna advocate for a dog park. Thank you. Okay. A dog park. Dog park. Okay. They're gonna be running loose anyway. All those people down there with dogs, let's give them a space. <laughs> Thanks. We'll see. Alan? Yeah. I'll add on to the great presentation and great design. I like all of what you're doing, especially the uh, the quality level and the and the interpretive uh, parts of it are, are really cool. And to answer your question, I do not want a thousand people a day in any one of my neighborhood parks. <laughs> <laughs> that would be crazy. Uh, this is a different scale of park with a different kind of programming than any other park that we have, even close. What's, what, give me an example of visits per day to other kinds of parks? I don't know. I don't think we've ever done anything like this before. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is you know, from a, from a cro programmatic and, um, and a technical standpoint, this is definitely the biggest project Parks has ever taken on. Yeah. I mean, well, Amazon was sort of big, but I feel like the skate park was a little bit, like had this level of technicality and, and a bigger budget, but not the kind of budget, not this kind of riverfront budget. Yeah. So the, the the riverfront park, everything but the plaza, that's the $14 million. And then the plaza, we just talked about the funding. What's the, so what's the time frame for that? It, it's really integrated with with Williams and Dame and how they're doing it. Right, right. So they, um, so I think the DDA currently says that uh, the buildings around it are, uh, have to start construction by 2022. So that doesn't prevent them from starting earlier. It doesn't, you know, but that's kind of, it gives you a time, sort of the out time frame. So I think, and the DDA, I think also, um, there's an agreement in there that the, the plaza is there by the time the buildings are completed. So this is a very, you know, symbiotic thing. So that, so to me, the time frame is that we're probably constructing in 2021 or, or shortly thereafter or in 2022 or something like that. It's a little fuzzy, um, but it, but we're not including it with this first phase because we want to do some more programming work around it. Yeah. Right. And building it beforehand and having bulldozers go on around all. Right. And I think also, a good appeal to yeah. And, and we really want, um, we want eyes on the park, right? We want immediate neighbors with people there and activities happening there and people going to get their ice cream or get a coffee or get a beer and, you know, and that it really helps activate the space so that the plaza isn't operating in isolation. Right. I think it's, it's pretty, that's pretty important. Yeah. It's, it's pretty integrated into the, into the redevelopment site. It'd be a cool destination. Point yes. The river. Yes. Right. The steam plant will help. The steam plant, I think, will help. I think it will be the you know it'll be the only building on the site when we open the riverfront. But I think you know having those two ends will be wonderful. Um, also, on, not related to the park, but um, in the AIS, there was a uh, maybe somebody already asked this, but um, river loans, a million dollars. What is that? So we have um, in the, the, the downtown uh, urban renewal district, we have a loan program. And so we have a provision for doing, um, having a, have a similar program in the urban renewal district on the riverfront. So we're proposing to hold aside a portion of the um, financial capacity in the district to be able to do that ongoing. Oh, okay, so that's the loan pool. It's the same as the we have downtown, right. but we just call it river loans instead. Exactly. Because we're clever. I get it, okay. <laughs> That makes sense to me. That's all I got. Okay. Hey, anybody else need another round? All right. Well, thank you very much. Very, very exciting project. We're looking forward to the next next iteration. So thank you so much. See you again soon. <laughs> oh, and I guess that means I'm I will close the meeting of the uh, Urban Renewal Agency and reopen the City Council meeting. Council work session. And so next up, single use plastic items.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm Michael Wist, Waste Prevention Program Manager. Thank you for having me back to discuss single-use plastics again. Uh, joining me tonight is Ethan Nelson. He's the city's uh, intergovernmental relations manager um, who will provide some legislative updates um, related to some of our recommendations at the end of this presentation. So a quick recap of our last meeting. Um, we discussed single-use plastics you know, and what they are, which is simply a plastic with a one-time use, typically non-recyclable, long-lived in the environment and landfill, and um, prevalent basically everywhere we go. Um, I passed around, as Chris alluded to, uh, various containers and material types to talk about you know, what we experience, uh, potential plastic alternatives, and some of the difficulties they, uh, they bring with them. Um, we had also discussed how a lot of this can be viewed as a litter control, an attempt to control litter, as many of these single-use products, um, when they end up in the environment, uh, pose the same types of issues that plastics do. We had also discussed what other municipalities have done to address these issues and uh, pending state bills at the time. Today, we'd like to discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages of the alternative materials that are used in single-use items, uh, as was requested last time, and also discuss health considerations for restaurants and retail food patrons, and also provide a legislative update uh, paired with our staff recommendations. So often when we uh, talk about the materials, we, we tend to place most of our environmental concerns related to attributes. Um, DEQ has taken this up and discussed what attributes mean. We we tend to listen for things that are compostable or recyclable or biodegradable and try to make an eco-conscious choice based on that. But that doesn't speak to the whole in, the impacts of the life or the impacts of the life cycle of the product from its uh, production through its disposal. So what uh, our partners at DEQ have done is a they did a literature review where they reviewed dozens and dozens, dozens of life cycle analysis studies that compared different types of packaging and food serviceware items, both from biosourced, plastic, compostable. Um, and they've wrapped that up just later in 2018 and are now sharing their results. Um, throughout this study, uh, cups were the most commonly studied product, but it includes several different studies that also talked about utensils and serviceware and uh, some carry-out style containers. So today we'll be focusing on the surface, uh, serviceware part of the study. And I'll talk through this. <laughs> so we're... In this, this slide right here is looking at the bio-based versus non-bio-based uh, alternatives. Bio-based is uh, packaging made of renewable feedstocks that can be replenished as they are used. You know, these are most often plant-based, although some are plastic, but mostly paper and board. Uh, it does not imply biodegradability or compostability. Um, it's simply where they're from, their source. Um, Non-bio-based is the opposite. Um, Non-renewable resources were used in its production and typically petroleum-based. So if you look to the chart on the right, green means good, and red means bad. Um, these methods highlight trends across the various studies that were compared in this review. So trends that tend towards the better will show up in the green, poorer, and red. The diamond um, indicates the net result of the review. So when we look at a bio-based versus non-bio-based food serviceware item, there's typically a gain towards the positive, and this is just trends. In general, there's a gain in the positive towards uh, global warming impacts. But as you begin to go down, tick down the line, you'll notice that it become increasingly worse for the environment, acidification, ozone depletion, ecotoxicity, human toxicity. Most of that can be attributed to the production uh, of these materials. When you think of pulp and, and paper mills and um, the agricultural need for a lot of these items. So when you look at a life cycle analysis, it creates a fuller picture of the impacts of all these different materials. So similarly, when we look at a compostable 
versus non-compostable. So it'd be a compostable item that has been composted, <laughs> composted versus a non-compostable item. By compostable, it means it degrades like a, a natural item would. Uh, it yields CO2 water in organic compounds at a similar rate to a naturally produced item. If we look at the information that DEQ has provided, we find that uh, compostable materials trend significantly more towards poor performance in a life cycle analysis than non-compostable materials. Mm -hmm. And I think the this next slide is probably the most uh, counterintuitive, but this is something that DEQ has been saying for a while. That if we look at an item that's compostable and been composted versus an item that's compostable but hasn't been composted, the composted item is much worse than the compostable item that was not composted. Meaning that for compostable items generally perform better when they're landfilled, incinerated, or recycled. <clears throat> so, what does that mean? When we look at it from a material perspective in a life cycle analysis, there's no one material that significantly outweighs plastic as a replacement. Um, you know, all food service wear materials, single use uh, food service wear materials present significant challenges. So this leads us uh, to multi-use service wear, which we had talked at length about in our last meeting. Uh, this would be like durables, which are used inside uh, for dine-in purposes, or reusables where a customer might bring in a, their own carry-out container. I'm going to reach out to Lane County Environmental Health to understand, what, first of all, what some of the liabilities might be to restaurant and retail food service owners, but also some of the health implications uh, for people bringing uh, potentially dirty or infected um, or contaminated uh, reusable items for their own personal use. And as it turns out, because of sophisticated research methods when outbreaks do happen, there's actually limited liability for a restaurant. It'd be pretty easy to figure out where a person got sick, if it was their own container or if it was something that was born from the kitchen or something like that. But there, there's uh, considerations that would re it definitely requires a contamination-free process that would be permitted um, inside of the food retailer. And, and these become difficult to scale across all our different types of restaurants from large dine-in or cafeteria style places down to food carts, which would all be affected by a ban on, on uh, single use items. They have to institute barriers to prevent backsplash if they take uh, someone's contaminated container over the counter. They can only rinse. They can't do any kind of washing for a customer that would commingle it with their own. Um, they have to have more hand cleaning stations. And the the best option they could provide me was that they could, uh, staff could serve food in a reusable bowl and the customer would have to transfer it to their own carry out. And I, in a very informal non-scientific uh, survey, I did a few restaurant owners in the area, mostly, uh, mostly places I frequent. Just to be clear about that, this is not scientific and does not qualify as a robust input from the community. but. You know, the concerns were that they're generally, uh, our restaurateurs want to be part of the solution. But there are real costs when you start requesting massive infrastructure changes or increased labor. I mean, to clean additional dishes and things like that could slow down service lines. And obviously, profit's going to be a concern and increased costs will be a concern for retail food operators. But slowing down service is another way to do that, space concerns. Um, but one thing that came up is being careful on how we dissuade carryout containers because we do not want to promote increased food waste um, or people just leaving their food waste at a restaurant rather than be able to take that home. So I, I think in that, I mean, that from the waste prevention world and the way things are trending now is something we absolutely cannot have happen. So we got to find a way to both mix carryout and people being able to bring their home uh, food home and not be denied if they don't have their own carryout containers. 
So upon meeting with DEQ, Lane County, and a few other partners, um, primarily colleagues in other municipalities, uh, we considered a number of well, drafting recommendations, a number of items of drafting recommendations for council. So as mentioned, there's really a lack of suitable material alternatives for single use plastic items when you look at the whole life cycle. And relying solely on reusable carryout items creates difficulties for customers and retailers on a large scale and may potentially promote increased food waste. Um, some medical conditions and uh, post-operative conditions require use of plastic straws for customers. Um, and it's something you actually see in the other municipalities we had talked about, that they still require restaurants to hold on to some supply of plastic straws for these types of cases. But also a behavior change models may have a broader beneficial impact on solid waste and recycling. And that's something we can, we can do both from an ordinance side of things and a regulatory side of things and also an educational side of things. And I'll talk more about that in both realms. So what are some educational possibilities? Well, even later uh, in 2018, when I was here talking about our recycling, our current recycling situation, I talked about we're designing a comprehensive educational campaign that utilizes all different types of media. And um, we're currently working with Lane County to develop a survey to understand better uh, what our messaging should be around such a campaign so we're not wasting time and money sending the wrong messages to people. And also what would be the best type of behavior change models? And when I say behavior change, I say, I mean nudging people in a direction to be more conscientious consumers and wasters in a sense. With the benefit, there's always ways to save yourself money by purchasing less, but also understanding more about a life cycle analysis and what our purchasing decisions mean. And as we're currently constructed in our offices, um, we have opportunities uh, to direct uh, for direct business engagement around some of these issues. We currently run the Love Food Not Waste, uh, Food Waste uh, Prevention Program. We have over 200 participatory businesses. And we also have the Mayor's Bold Step Award model, which helps uh, environmentally friendly business practices be promoted and then also promotes those businesses who are, are meeting those goals. But we can also create ordinances, ordinances that nudge people into more informed decision making. Now, earlier today, I had sent an email that had amended some of the original um, recommendations that were in the AIS. It didn't really, it didn't amend the, I guess, the heart of the issue. It just more created some time considerations um, to pair with progress we're seeing at the state behind some, behind some statewide um, initiatives or uh, bills that are in committee right now. So. Uh, Ethan will speak a little bit more to that, and then we'll jump back into some of the meat of uh, staff recommendations. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so Michael made the LCA, made it muddier with LCA and then business operations, and then I'll just add on the political context. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's the, as, as the, <laughs> that clarity. As uh, you read in the email, I hope that you had the chance to scan through it. Uh, all three of these issues uh, are currently have bills that are being uh, processed through committee right now at, at, in Salem. And so um, on the House Bill 2509 um, uh, plastic bag ban, um, you, you know, as, as it was proposed, it would be fine for us. It wouldn't have any impact, but then the amendments that are coming forward would preempt local control. It would move uh, from five cents to 10 cents. Um, and then also uh, it would add restaurants. So those are just different things that if it passes would impact Eugene. So we wanted to be mindful of that. Uh, in regards to the polystyrene ban, the second item, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, House Bill 2883, that one would set a floor, again, a statewide standard for uh, banning polystyrene for um, food takeout. Um, and so that one is broad-based. It's a fairly simple bill, and um, it's kind of moving through committee, and we're not necessarily sure what the life of that will be. <clears throat> and then last is the uh, single-use uh, service wear, and that one's just uh, the bills right now are just plastic straws. 
but um, because plastic straws would be incorporated with, within a broader service wear uh, uh, ordinance, um, then we would want to be uh, mindful of those. So um, I'm here to answer any questions if those come on up. So. So just to talk about the recommendations themselves, um, so the first one we had was uh, direct the city manager to draft an amendment to the current bag ban to include single-use carryout bags for retail food businesses. And as Ethan had mentioned, we would um, advise to wait until seeing how House Bill 2509 comes along in the state legislature, but being prepared once we have an update or a better understanding of where that is moving to be able to move on with that. Similarly, uh, the second one is direct the city manager to draft an ordinance banning polystyrene carryout containers. And again, being prepared to move on that once we have more understanding of how it'll work out with the state. Um, so waiting for that, but being prepared once we have a better idea. But the third one was we, we have no amendment to directing the city manager to draft an ordinance and schedule a public hearing. Um, requiring retail food businesses to provide single-use service wear and utensils only upon request to the, by the customer. And this would include straws, lids, utensils, stirs, and um, packaged individual use condiments. Um, that recommendation is more based on the behavior change model I had spoke about, where if it's something where you're asking the customer that they have to be involved with on a regular consumption, like a conscientious consumption based manner. This might lead to more gains into how they think about their recycling uh, when they, when they might stop the recycling container next time and give an extra thought about what should go in there and what shouldn't. And we feel like these behavior change models have potential for a, a broader impact. And a, a public hearing is be the first time we'd actually be hearing from the community at large around these issues. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions and discussion. Okay, thank you very much. It's kind of overwhelming and discouraging, actually. It feels like it's hard to get ahead of this one in a kind of a rational way. So I'm very interested in my colleagues and what they have to say. Uh, Mike, you can head it off, and then Alan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, when I was a kid, I'm pretty sure everybody at this table, except maybe one, maybe, is uh, old enough to remember being a younger person um, when a can of soda had a pull tab on it that came completely off, and you could find those babies everywhere. I mean, you could find those things everywhere. Jimmy Buffett stepped on one or something, you know, I mean, right? Yeah. Until they developed a better way to do that, and every manufacturer of beverages in the world went, yep, we're done doing it that way, because this is way better, and we don't have those things lying around all over the place. That was an adoption that didn't require legislation. I appreciate all the work to finding that there's not, that forcing this issue doesn't create better options is what it sounds like right away. But I will say this, it, it shocks me that so many other states, and there are several, deal with plastic waste uh, differently than we do in Oregon or better than we, I don't know about right way to say that. Um, and recyclable specifically is what I'm talking about. In a place where we're known for innovating how we do things like this, I think we should be leading the same kind of thing like the Chamber of Commerce does with angel investing where people can talk about um, inventions and ideas and be able to compete for funding to create entire new industries. I think we should be intentionally setting up ways for people to innovate how to deal with waste and how to deal with it in a way that is doesn't produce as many of the negatives or comes up with a better way to have containers, one use single use containers be created. I mean, I think we ought to, instead of forcing people to comply, I think we ought to be on the end of Let's see if we can be the home of the place that comes up with the better option, the one that everybody seems to want to adopt because it makes more sense. It's, it costs less money to everybody involved and it's better for the environment and everything else. I mean, why don't we have a competition? Because if there's a place where we could come up with better options, I'm sure it's here. 
And so I, I, I'm not the sort that whose first response is to try and force top down people to comply with different ways to behave. I'd much rather be a part of coming up with a better option that people naturally want to adopt. So that's my two cents worth. Okay. Alan. Yeah, thanks for this info. Um, actually, the, the composting of these materials not always being a good idea actually makes a lot of sense to me. Those, those, paper, those cardboard brown bag or uh, cart containers with the liner in them, when uh, I know that Washington was um, composting those and they ended up having that stuff leach out into the water. And uh, now we're seeing the, the constituents that are in that particular thing all in our water supply and in, and, and, and all over the place. And it's be, they're becoming what are known as pollutants or contaminants of emerging concern. They're not quite being banned yet, but they're going to be pretty soon. So actually just taking them and sticking them in a landfill and letting them sit there is actually better than composting them because it doesn't doesn't impact the environment as much. Um, but, uh, you know, your graphs are really interesting, the DEQ graphs. Uh, I found them super interesting. Um, the one thing that uh, is interesting uh, to me is that the choice of materials in terms of consumption-based inventory of greenhouse gases makes a big difference. What you do with it after that is, is, a, is a different story. But um, and, and that was the, one of the major green bars on the uh, bio-based versus non-bio-based uh, materials. Um, on the particular staff recommendations, you can go back a page, a slide. Um, HB 2509, is that basically our, the, what we do right now? Does it mimic that or is it different? <clears throat> Councilor Zelenka, it is close. Um, it has many of the... Without the amendment. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's fairly close. Um, what if it passes? The main difference that I just kind of looked at was that um, the state's standard for uh, reusable plastic bags says uh, is a is a uh, a thinner um, gauge than what ours is. Uh, what what ours has in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's it's pretty close. But these. Amendments potentially preempt any local. Would it grandfather us in, or is it just preempt everybody from doing? Uh, preempts everybody at this point. And then it would increase it to five cent, or t from five cents to ten cents. Oh. And, and and I think the discussion right now is that nobody like the ten cent amendments are giveaways to uh, grocers, and it's being pushed by grocers, uh, whereas most. Cities and most of the legislators are like, yeah, five cents makes most sense. You know, so I think that that's a one that could be like, you know, secured to say five cents as a as a top. Yeah, and and the reason we have that in there is actually twofold. One was that it is actually more expensive to have a paper bag than it is a plastic bag, um, uh, and sometimes even the the ones that market choice with the handles are twelve cents versus like one or two cent for a plastic bag. So a regular paper bag is, is so it was to avoid the cost shift onto the onto the grocers but also to put some value on it like the bottle bill having a just a simple fee like that even though it's five or ten cents makes a huge difference in people's attitudes towards that um, in, in in this direction it's uh, would support including restaurants which is the basically this uh, uh, recommendation number one but remove the preemption and maintain the five cent fee and I could support that um, on the polystyrene, so 2883 is just an outright statewide ban on polystyrene containers for food, just food vendors. Correct. That used, uh, that's probably, so that does that include styrofoam cups and the clam shells? Yes. Okay. And then, um, and then there's a multitude of bills on straws. Is that what I understand? <laughs> There's, there's currently three bills. Uh, there's uh, a House bill and a Senate bill that are companions. So they're roughly the same thing, just working through the different chambers. And then there's a, another House bill, but that one, um, it, I think it's been assigned to committee, but I don't think it's going to have a hearing. And it's uh, um, one that would just uh, apply it to um, full service restaurants, so like a walk-in, who wouldn't be for fast food. And, and is the two bills that have 
legs, are they on request only bills? Yeah. Yes. So essentially the same recommendation that we have. Yes. Okay. So I support all three of these um, these notions, and um, I guess the question is wait to see what happens in the legislature or not. We're really only, bills are going to either uh, die or not within about another month or so, two months at the max. I think in April, if it doesn't go on, move on, it, it doesn't, it's not going to go anywhere. So um, really, we're not talking about months and months and months. We're talking about a couple of months to wait and to see what happens at the legislature. And, and we've done this before, like on the minimum wage, we were poised to take on minimum wage, but the state was working on it. We just said, well, let's see what they do. And they, what they did wasn't exactly what, what I had in mind, but it was close enough. So we didn't have to spend a lot of staff resources getting us there. Um, so I, I, I think sending a message that we support all of these things, but waiting until we see what happens in the legislature is a good way to go. Chris. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I do remember pull tabs. And um, <laughs> and they were everywhere, yeah. and and I think the interesting thing is that was a different world and a different time. And I think carrots worked a whole lot better back then. Mm -hmm. And I think we have moved away from a mostly carrot structure to a lot more stick. Um, sadly, I wish we didn't have to use the stick as often as we do, but unfortunately, we've reached I think a place where we do have to use the stick a little bit more than we might have in the past. Um, a question about uh, the the reusables. I noticed that there was a, a, an aluminum foil container. And if I recall, aluminum foil or, or, or things made of aluminum are more recyclable than a lot of other things? In general, um, it, it becomes difficult making a real broad generalization on foil because it all depends on size and then the ability to be cleaned before recycled. Okay. So, so it has to be it has to be cleaned. Yeah. Okay. That was that was really what I was getting at is, you know, that could be the magic solution is we just use aluminum, but apparently that needs to be cleaned as well. Okay. Um, with that with that in mind, I'm fine with all the recommendations of your I think I think that's that's great. And I particularly like um, the recommendations to the IGR manager to coordinate on this stuff. Um, I like uh, trying to deal with the preemption element. I think that's a really important one. Um, and uh, I think the uh, work to be done uh, around 2883 is also good. Um, I think we've done a lot of good work. We want to try to have that recognized and reflected to the degree we can. So I think, I think that's really good. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with any of these and the way they're structured and how we would go forward with them. I think that's absolutely fine. It is a problem and we have to deal with it. So. Emily. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with the mayor. It's kind of disappointing. It's not the magic I wanted, but um, the information is very important, and I appreciate the clear presentation and, and all the research you did um, that gave me a lot of information I didn't know. Um, so I wish we could be more leading edge instead of waiting to see what the state does right now. But I also don't want to waste waste our time, so we should we should wait. I do take um, a bunch of solace from from Mike's push for alternatives, and I I think that our hands are kind of tied right now. So I would really encourage us to delve into that. Uh, we should talk. Um, the life cycle analysis really helped me a lot because we do have to consider the environmental costs of the production of the item. So. I think it's actually better for the environment to make plastic than, than wood stuff. I didn't really say that. Um, but I, that was interesting. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm always concerned about preemption. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I wonder about getting things on the agenda because it would be a public hearing. I'm thinking it wouldn't be as hard to schedule it sooner because we do those on the third Monday. And so I was hoping to say, yeah, let's do it for April, but it sounds with the legislature, um, I'd at least like to put a plug in for, uh, let's hope we can do it in May. But that does mean that we need to direct the manager to have the ordinance stuff written and I don't wanna waste our time. So I'm a little bit dilemmaed. You wanna speak to that? Yeah, Councilor Semple. Uh, my feeling is that these bills will 
be alive until the end. And, uh, I do, and so I would say, you know, Councilor Zelenka gave an estimation of like, it, you know, we'll know in a couple months of the bills that didn't make it out of committee. Sure, I believe this will, these will keep on living until the end uh, because they've got a lot of uh, support, but they might not have enough support to be passed. So I would say that if you're, um, if the council intends to uh, direct uh, for uh, scheduling a, um, a public hearing, I would say more than likely to be on the safe side, it would be in July, would be the, would because the, the uh, legislative session ends at the end of June. Um, and that way we'd know for certain where it would be. And so we'd have to have another work session before then to direct to have, write the ordinance or no? Items. No, um, as I understand it with the proposals in front of you, it would, um, you would still be moving to address, so let's just take the first one. Um, you would still be moving to direct the city manager to draft an amendment okay, to the current okay. ban. Um, and you can say to draft an amendment and schedule a public hearing. But then there, and their further direction would be the understanding we'd wait, and then also you'd give direction to the IGR. And it's the same for the other three. I got it. Um, the one piece that I would add is that on um, the single use service where that's the one where the uh, the way that the bills are being worked right now, uh, I think that if that one does move forward, it would have a, and that's the um, uh, Senate Bill 90, that that one we could move forward with right now with a public hearing because the uh, Portland is, has passed their uh, their single OU service um, ordinance, and it's not going to come into effect until um, July uh, of this year. And so there's a carve out for municipalities who have um, uh, um, adopted and implemented before the legislation, the, the, the bill would come into um, uh, effect. And so if the city were to put out for public hearing, and then the city council determined to pass an ordinance, we would likely be able to get into that grandfather. That would that would be the lobbying position that I would go forward with and start to work on that in alignment with the city of Portland. I would really like that. <laughs> that would at least, you know, get us a little to the forefront. So, um, yeah, let's do that. Thank you. I, even though I'm still disappointed. So if uh, item three passes, our intent would be to bring that back to a public hearing in May. Okay. Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Michael, I love it when you're here. I always learn something new. <laughs> and it's so great to base your behavior on actual facts than what you wish was true. <laughs> and I find the more I learn from you, the more I need to stop base, just making consumer choices based on I can recycle this or it'll compost someday and really change my behaviors. And so I love this idea of a comprehensive campaign and I'm wondering if you have found funding for that yet or if that's something you're going to need in the future. Um, we have a pretty strong seed funding for it right now and I don't see it being an issue moving forward if we needed more funding to, to mm -hmm. budget for that. And do you have any timeline of when you're hoping to start? Well, for our um, residential food waste collection that will be rolling out um, later this spring or early summer, we've created two videos around that that we'll be re releasing soon. Um, it's in, that was pushed ahead because it's, it's coming this summer. Um, we're working with the county now with a private contractor to do, like I'd mentioned, uh, surveys to uh, Metro did it to the north. Um, and they came back with some interesting results about what messaging works and what doesn't in their community. So we're looking to do a similar one down here. So we could then build more of our campaign and messaging off of that. Fantastic, thank you. I, I have Mike and Alan in the queue, but I just wanna comment on this question of food waste and restaurants and people taking their, that there is a health component here about smaller portion size. <laughs> <laughs> Might help sort of <laughs> avoid the, the issue. <laughs> All right, with that said, Mike and then Alan. So it sounds to me like we're gonna have a motion here and Emily, I, I think that falls to you this yes. time here. So <laughs> did I understand you to say you were gonna make a motion to move ahead to a public hearing with a ban on utensils? Is that what I heard you say? No, that's not no. to, it's to. Which one was it on the third one? Third the third one, one. it's a, only on request. So you could bring your own spork or you could say, 
I need utensils. Yeah. And you would just be given them, but rather than putting it in your takeout bag, whether you ask for it or not, and it goes in the trash. So you just have to say, yes, I need a fork. Hmm. Okay, thanks. But you have to ask for it. Okay. Like a straw. Uh, Alan. So, um, is it okay to have a single motion for all three to make it simple? Something like along the lines of move to direct as recommended by staff with the addition of um, on the third one a public hearing in May? And just do it all in one shot. You can certainly do that. And if somebody would like to vote no on one of those, they can move to. Um, they're all kind divide. of grouped together. So. Yeah, you can absolutely uh, try that. Recommend you Thank you. Do it all at one, and with the <laughs> exception of May being a public hearing, and be a little bit more efficient. Okay, take it away, Councilor. Um, I move to direct the city manager to uh, do these three items listed in our AIS. With the third one. The third one uh, being scheduled for May. Second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on those? All in. F yep. Yep. Comments. I'm trying to understand what all the three include. Could you be a little more specific? It's that list. Right. And so just for clarity of the motion, it's um, there was actually three different ones in the AS. So the, oh, what you're moving on, but I know what you were looking at and I know what you were pointing to. So <laughs> just for clarity for the public, it's the motion is on that. Right, right. Except for the May part. So and with the addition of May. It's one. delay pending the legislative process on the first two pieces. Right, I get that. Right. Let me, okay. I have a question there. Yeah. So this does a ban if the legislature doesn't. It puts the, it, it asks the manager to prepare that for the if the legislature a, doesn't do it. On polystyrene. On polystyrene. On, on polystyrene, yeah. right? Yep. Yep. Even though it's worse for the environment. The polystyrene is different, I think, than like the lined, the lined boxes. Uh, can I have you answer? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, we included um, the carry out um, retail plastic bags and polystyrene because uh, they were viewed separately from the analysis we put before. Uh, polystyrene is a well-known uh, human, uh, basically it, it leaches poisonous chemicals both into the environment and into our bodies when we consume from it. Um, it has become a, an ocean-borne uh, problem as well. Yeah, all this didn't include polystyrene. That was just for compostable. It's a different analysis. Well, polystyrene is really, really bad. And Portland's had banned since the 80s. But the effect will be, if we were to ban polystyrene, the effect will be some of the things, and, and what I didn't understand was, were you comparing the polystyrene to these? Because we were talking about plastics at the beginning. So I'm just a little bit confused as to the materials we were comparing at the beginning. Right, um, so polystyrene may have been, this is a, a review of dozens of different studies that reviewed tens of thousands of different materials looking at the trends. So I can't say polystyrene was or was not included in the huge literature review, but we're moving with polystyrene as a separate issue, understanding that it has both human health impacts as well as environmental impacts. All right, thank you. Okay, ready for a vote? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, and none opposed. It passes. Thank you all very much. We're adjourned until 7.30.